with the Oklahoma Ethics Consortium, and I have the uh, great honor of thanking a lot of people today. So I have cheat sheets. Um, first, I'd like to welcome all the new folks that we have with us today. And if you would please stand up if this is your first time to be with the Oklahoma Ethics Consortium today, so we can give you a proper welcome. There's a lot of new people, I understand. And we're not picking on you, we do this every month. Bobby Long. 
trust by Stevie Hogan. And so I will make sure that you get the book. So well done. Good job. <laughs> so we really want to extend our appreciation to Bobby Bobby and let them know how much we appreciate the support. Uh, thank you. Big round of applause if you could give to Bobby Bobby. Because usually passion and, and commitment 
you don't think of as connected with integrity and ethics and right doing, right? I mean, usually people have passion for sports, people have commitment for work, people have commitment to make money, people have passion to do wrong things sometimes. But I like it because your mission statement starts out in the right way. That is, you're passionate and you're committed to demonstrate best practices and you're prepared to educate, you're prepared to make people aware of what is right in this country, what should be done in this country. You know, uh, we, uh, our, our staff, we were commenting after the dinner last night and preparing notes uh, with your leadership about what you do and what the Center for the Public Trust does. And you know, we have so uh, very consistent, very complimentary objectives. We started out uh, in, the, in the wake of all the scandals of uh, Enron, WorldCom, and Adelphia, Tyco, and uh, CPAs, and lawyers, and, and CEOs getting blamed for everything and, and painted with a broad brush of being irresponsible, cheaters, uh, crooks. And you know, we said, wait just a minute. We know CPAs, we know lawyers, and we know CEOs, and by far, most of them are not that way at all. And we want to demonstrate uh, the other side. You're going to still hear enough of the negative on CNN. You're going to still read in the newspapers about the scandals. And that's, that has its place. But my goodness, shame on all of us, if we don't get the news out, look, there are people in, there, in this room right here, and there are people throughout this country who go to work every day, and they model best practice. They do the right thing. We want to talk about those people. And that's the people you're talking about, and, and we honor you in that. So uh, I, I was uh, reading a, an article by Harvard K. the other day, and telling a story about a, a professor, final exams at a, 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 a senior class in college, had a different kind of exam. Students walk in. He says, students, I have three types of questions. You get to make the choice. There are the harder questions. You may select that. Or you may want to select the easier questions. Or third choice yet, you can select the easiest questions. So they went through the test. And afterward, many of them were frustrated. They said, wait just a minute. We have a C. All of it. A's, some got these. How'd you grade this thing? He said, first of all, he said, if you took the harder questions, you got an A. If you took the easier ones, you got a B. The easiest, though, you got a C. Most of them have taken the easiest questions. He said, you don't realize. He said, I wasn't really testing your knowledge. I know from, from having you the past semester what you know. He said, what I was testing was your aim. Where are your aim? What, what are your aspirations? What do you really want to do? And you know, that's what you're about in Oklahoma Business Ethics Consortium. You're really testing aim. You're really trying to raise people's sights above just their knowledge. You know, uh, most all the, all the crooks you read about, all the people who demonstrate unethical practice, they have knowledge. In fact, many times, they're craftier and smarter than, than the people who do it right. But what they have failed to do is raise their sights to the ethical, to the integrity, the foundation building blocks of what makes us great as a nation. So today, we honor you. Uh, we, we believe in what you're doing promoting ethics, promoting leadership uh, and integrity. I love your guiding principles, responsibility toward self, toward others, and leading in integrity. That is the right area to begin with. You know, if we get everything else right and, 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 and we build it on a foundation of sand with unethical uh, uh, pursuits and just going after things that are not right, uh, it, it will crumble. So we are after the same thing, so we honor you today. Now we'll call Sh Shannon uh, up here to present this award. Shannon, I, I think we'll both get up here. Come on up. Uh, uh, Shannon, uh, you know her much better than I do, but uh, she really uh, has been very shy in accepting any kind of award. But if we know whose idea this was, whose vision this great enterprise, uh, who had that vision? It was Shannon. And it, it, the dream 
It's being realized day after day. Every member you have 700 strong now, and you'll have twice that many in a couple of years. It, it, it's going great because this lady had a dream, had a vision, and put legs to it. And today, on uh, behalf of the Center for Public Trust, Shannon and I will present your organization, the Oklahoma Business Ethics Commission, with this being a difference of work, because you truly are, not only in Oklahoma City and Oklahoma, but throughout the country, you're being a difference. And so this award is for you and your organization. accept an award herself. You didn't know that. She wanted to accept an award on behalf of the consortium. But we do have something for her. And it's these flowers here, Jen, you may present those to her. And these flowers are for you. And again, we just appreciate so much her vision, her dreaming, her continuing to dream about how Oklahoma City can lead this nation. And by the way, you're the only city, the only state that I know of that has this kind of a program, and our wheels have already started turning, Shannon, in the Center for the Public Trust, because we need to promote this in every state. So uh, we'll be talking with you on how to do that. Would you like to say something? Yes, I will. I will put my next Oh, you let your notes, okay. Well, Shannon will come up, and I will leave. But anyway, thank you, Oklahoma Business Ethics. You're doing a great job. You're modeling best practices. You're educating students and business people all throughout the city, all throughout the state. We appreciate you. Congratulations. Chairman. So I totally understand about um, 
being swept up, and they called you a, a tsunami, I get that. Um, well, we don't have the impact of professional lives of, what is it, 650,000 CPAs? Is that what you tell them last night? It's a lot of people. Um, I can tell you that moving from six to 700 members was a pretty big jump for an all-volunteer organization. And we've made our share of mistakes, um, logistics and meeting details, but the values, the values have endured all this time. There is something about Oklahoma values of integrity at work that really resonate with others. And we don't have to spell it out, but people immediately know what that means. It's a sense of community that is united by a strong desire to live by moral compass that is pointed normal. You know, last night, speaking of community, just coincidentally last night, I got an email from a former Oklahoma City member who moved to Kansas City. And she said, I'm going to start an OK Epic Street from Kansas City. I miss you guys. I need some help. Now, I don't know if the name OK Epic's will fly in Kansas City, <laughs> but we'll work on it. Um, you may sense a little pride at Oklahoma Values, but please don't misunderstand. We know that joining an Epic Street doesn't give anybody a high mind feeling of superiority. In fact, it's quite the opposite. One reason that we have monthly meetings is because we know that ethics is something that we have to continually reinforce. And our members welcome the opportunity to learn more and discuss experiences with those that we trust. There's a tremendous amount of wisdom in this room, and I'm grateful to every one of you who have learned about the ethics. People like Edith, and Bob, so many people, special people, who roll up their sleeves and they'll be right there with you through thick and thin. So, Mr. Costello, if you want to pursue that vision of a national organization to a national platform, you will find no more committed, passionate friends than what you have in the heart of So, call us. You're going to see energy companies and accounting firms and human resource executives and CFOs, and all of us have that powerful connection in common. We might stumble sometimes, but we get right back up because we truly care about doing the right thing in our personal and our professional lives. Gandhi said, you must be the change that you wish to see in the world. Well, together, I think we can move forward as individuals and as a group in restoring trust in business. So let us know how we can help. In the meantime, I want you to understand that we, we get the significance of this award. It doesn't mean that we've arrived. We understand that. It means that we have a continuing responsibility to honor these high standards and expectations of our new friends at NASA. So, Lisa, and all of you who have traveled from New York and Nashville to be away from your families, to honor Oklahoma business ethics. Know that we are touched, we are inspired, we are encouraged, and we are deeply grateful for this award. Thank you.
While serving as an up-counsel uh, relationship with the law firm, Mr. Bridge Smith also serves as the executive director at the Institute for Conflict Resolution at Lipscomb University and as an officer and principal in Strategic Resolutions Group, LLC. In these roles, Mr. Bridgeman brings nearly 30 years of legal experience in dispute resolution and innovative workplace strategies to clients, students, and business entities alike. As a Walter Lansden attorney, Mr. Bridgeman Smith uh, integrates the practical, legal, and academic best practices in dispute resolution strategies in service to the firm's client relationships. Mr. Bridgesmith has provided counsel in several recent cases that have resulted in jury trial defense verdicts and the successful defense of class actions. Larry is recognized in the America's Best Lawyers by Woodward White Incorporated and Chambers, USA's America's leading lawyers for business for his expertise in labor and employment matters. He's an approved mediator pursuant to Tennessee Supreme Court Rule 31, and he also has an approved arbitrator for the uh, National Arbitration Forum and a panel uh, neutral for the American Health Lawyers Association. Prior to joining Wall, uh, Waller Lenson, Mr. Bridgesmith was the managing member of the national office of Constant, Constant G. Brooks and Smith LLC for 14 years. So please join me in giving a warm call and welcome to Larry Bridgesmith. Uh, what a delight it was last night to meet with uh, a number of the board members of the consortium and just get to see and sense this incredible enthusiasm that's taking place here locally on behalf of ethics. Uh, I bring you greetings from Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, I love the fact that today, at least in both of our fair cities, the weather is absolutely perfect, but from this point forward, if you could just keep the tornadoes in Oklahoma, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> We've had far too many of your visits lately, and uh, I, I loved getting to see Bricktown last night. Nashville has been involved in some downtown renovation for as long as I can remember, but we never got that far. Uh, we uh, don't have a brick town, we have a few brick out houses, <laughs> but that's about as good as it gets. And I uh, love the fact that downtown you have a, a stadium for baseball, we've been working on that, haven't succeeded there either. So I may just relocate to Oklahoma City, you've got a fabulous... It's obvious that you love the place you live, and that's always a delight. Uh, I love Nashville. I've been there for 30 years, and it's been a delight. For those of us who are at all concerned about ethics, it is certainly refreshing not to have the microscope pointed in our direction, as presently the world's ethics monitors are looking at Parliament and the House of Commons, and so their British brethren have begun to feel the heat and so much so that yesterday I understand the, the Speaker of the House of Commons, Michael Martin, resigned his role as Speaker. First time since 1695 that a Speaker of the House of Commons was forced to resign. And it became a result of the ethical lapses of the members of the House of Commons. Perhaps the icon of that uh, in Roblio will probably be forever remembered. Now, Mr. Douglas Hogg, H-O-G-G, who is an aristocrat. I don't know how he was able to be elected to the House of Commons, which I thought was for commoners, but Mr. Hogg chose to use $3,400 of the people's money in Britain to have the moat of his country estate claimed. And that sort of represents the excesses to which at least that set of ethical escapes, as they say at Boeing, took place. But the story has yet to be completely told. We will undoubtedly hear more. And the thing that I am fascinated with at the most recent announcement of the next ethical scandal is how many people knew and how many people either chose to say something and were ignored or more likely chose to say nothing because the culture of silence was so great. There was a young lawyer 
who was new in the law firm, had a young family, uh, two children, and a long career ahead of him, who was presented with a dilemma. And the dilemma was that the senior partner with whom that young lawyer worked had a problem, a very severe problem that began to manifest itself over the course of time with alcohol. And at some point, that problem began to become an ethics problem because client matters were unattended to. Malpractice was being committed. But this young lawyer had known the story of others who had preceded him and how when they rose and said, this is not right, they were either shipped off to Camp Swampy or terminated because you don't stand up and accuse a senior partner in an established law firm of anything unethical. Well, I survived that. But it was a year of terror. A year of terror which could not have been survived, but for the fact that there were individuals who worked together on behalf of a firm whose culture would not sit by and tolerate that behavior. Unfortunately, the senior partner who was given the option of getting help for his alcoholism, he chose not to, remained in denial, lost his partnership in the law firm, lost his family, literally died penniless on the streets rather than to accept responsibility. But whether it's parliament, a law firm, the question becomes, what's the difference between the way organizations respond to ethical lapses? The ethical culture, we were told with the enactment of SOX, is to be expected, but it's not defined. Sarbanes-Oxley does not tell us what an ethical culture is, but it's mandated. I don't know whether this works, but these are my thoughts about what an ethical culture consists of. There must be norms of behavior which are expected. How those norms are communicated becomes dependent upon the organization, its size, its complexity. But without those norms, there is no expectation. And with those norms comes knowledge. And in most effective organizations, there must be some sense of system to address those defections. And that requires some effort on someone's part to raise their hand, speak their piece, and the organization to respond. But most importantly, there's a need for skill. And a skill, fortunately or unfortunately, that we don't seem to, to focus on a great deal. And that's the skill of constructive confrontation. Whether it's Enron, or the FBI, or Parliament, or any setting in which any of us have encountered, our ability to have those crucial, those critical conversations is the missing link it seems to me, in all of these examples of organizational failure. It's the lack of understanding how to have a constructive confrontation that has caused most of these lapses to hit the newspapers. And the maintaining of that culture is accomplished through the way in which we coach, and mentor others. What can these lapses be attributed to? Sometimes it's the power distance index. I'm grateful to Gladwell for pointing out in his book, The Outliers, how the power distance index works. The best example of that is Korean flight, Korean Air Flight 807, the captain of which arose on an August day in 1997, like he did absolutely every other day. Prior, prior to taking command of the 747 that he would fly from Seoul to Guam. Having made that flight some eight times, having some 3,900 hours of, of flight time behind the helm of a 747, this was not an inexperienced captain. But on that particular night, Everything went according to form, everything went according to custom, the plane lifted off, 
and with 255 passengers on that routine flight to Guam, as they approached what they believed was the landing strip, that flight with an experienced crew flew into a mountain on the island of Guam, and 228 people perished. What happened? Why did that occur? Well, in reviewing the cockpit transcripts, it became apparent that the co-pilot was fully aware of what happened and what was about to happen. It wasn't a matter of knowledge. It wasn't a matter of skills. It was a matter of whether he had the temerity to refute the command of the captain. And point by point, you could hear the co-pilot in his comments to the captain and to the ground indicate his growing awareness through the use of very subtle language to try to communicate to the captain, but never directly, that we're on the right, the wrong flight path with full knowledge of where they were and where they were going, the co-pilot sat silently while the airplane flew into the mountain. Why? Well, according to Gladwell, it's the operation of the power distance index. And in the culture of the Korean uh, airlines, as well as in the culture itself, you don't tell someone in authority they're wrong. And even at the pain of perishing, Silence in that setting was preferred to confronting and challenging the authority of someone in authority. So a lot of the ethical lapses that we have seen can be attributed to some form of that power distance index, as those of us who feel we have no power or are too distant from the operation of the exercise of discretion and judgment are afraid and fear that it's not right place. Another ethical lapse can come from inconsistent leadership. Enron had all the perfect systems. Matter of fact, you can go on eBay today and buy a compliance program from Enron in mint condition. Never opened, never thumbed through, never written upon, but perfect in every way. It was the best compliance program that money could buy. But it didn't impact the culture. Because the leadership apparently lived by a different standard. And when Sharon Watkins rose her hand and said, something's amiss, and these funding mechanisms aren't really kosher, the result of the organization was to terminate rather than investigate. So inconsistency at the leadership level can be the cause of this culture and a lapse of ethical attributed to those organizations. And sometimes it's the system itself. Sometimes the system doesn't work, as in the FBI with Colleen, who raised her hands and said, you know, I think we have evidence of terrorist activity two months before the September 11 attacks. But the system didn't respond. There was no mechanism in place for someone in one city far away to raise her hand and say, we need to look at foreigners on our soil in terms of their capacity to do damage and apparently their willingness to sacrifice themselves to do that. The system failed. And sometimes it's because there's a lack of skill. And I think in all of these common denominator situations is the skill issue that I believe is the one that we can find in every one of those lapses. It's not easy for us to stand up and have those critical conversations, but it's something that can be accomplished if the culture and the training is provided to people in order to do so. KPMG does an annual survey, and in most recent years, the results are pretty astonishing. 52% of people working in American business or in accounting and auditing indicate on a yearly basis they observe misconduct. 36% in that annual survey indicate that they have observed in the past year 
more than a single event of misconduct. If those people observing misconduct were doing what their systems and their organizations expect them to do, there wouldn't be enough bobs to go around Boeing or any other organizations because they would be so busy deciding right from wrong, accuracy from inaccuracy, meritoriousness from misperception that they would be full-time engaged with many, 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 many more of them trying to deal with whether or not misconduct in fact occurred. So the question I have, as someone who's been in the practice of law for 30 years, is how can we improve the ability of individuals to stand up and in a constructive way report misconduct when they believe it occurs and allow the systems in place and the knowledge that we all have of what is expected out of ethical behavior to affect and reduce the level and the currency and the frequency of the lapses in ethical behavior. Well, I'd like to share with you three key ideas that I think can help us there. Because it takes a holistic approach. It's not just one or another of these that need to be addressed. It's all of them. And one of the key ideas that I would suggest that we pay attention to is that in conflict situations, when we have an opportunity to be in opposition to someone else, we have choices. And we exercise those choices, sometimes out of habit, but more often than not, out of intent. And the best way that I know to explain these five choices, and this is this is a premise that's been in the world of conflict management for about 50 years, attributed to some professors, Thomas and Kilman, who helped us understand the human reactions and behaviors when confronted with a conflict situation. The best way to understand it is by way of a graph. The graph reflects two different opposing forces. One of them is how important is the issue about which we are concerned? And the other is, how important is the relationship? As those two forces are always in play to some degree or another, the choices that we make when confronted with difficult moments can be measured by the way in which we value and therefore choose to respond in relationship to whether the issue is important or the relationship is important or both. And the first choice that a lot of us are aware of is the choice of avoidance. But when we avoid, understand that on this graph of importance, we're saying that neither the issue nor the relationship is important. We choose to avoid or should choose to avoid when it doesn't matter, when nothing is of consequence. We can walk away from conflict with a good, clean conscience that we've done the right thing. It doesn't require the investment of my time or energy. But the more important the relationship or the more important the issue, there may be a different choice that we need to exercise. And one of those is the choice of accommodation. And we accommodate or relinquish my rights to your rights when the relationship is supremely important and the issue has little importance. For example, when I get home tonight around 7.30 in Nashville, I can predict to you what my wife's first question would be. Where do you want to eat? Now at that point, having been a part of this endeavor all day, and traveling all afternoon and evening, do I really care where we eat? I just want to be with my wife, and I don't want to have to argue about my preferences over hers. I will choose to accommodate. I will want her to choose where we eat, because my relationship with her is far more important than the fact that I don't like pasta. <laughs> And if she wants pasta, we're going to the Italian restaurant. I'll find something else to eat. But accommodation is a legitimate choice in conflict situations 
when relationship is more important than the issue. But we don't always have that luxury, do we? Sometimes the issue is the most important and we are prepared to sacrifice relationship. When that occurs, we exercise the choice of competition. I will win at your expense because the issue is more important than my relationship with you. Accommodation is, you will win at my expense because relationship is more important. So in the world of business ethics, oftentimes we don't have the luxury of saying one or the other can be chosen. It isn't always and frankly rarely is an either or option. More often than not, there's some level of relationship, there's some level of issue that's important that we have to attend to. So what other choices do we have? Well, one of those choices is to compromise. I give a little, you give a little, and together we reach an outcome that frankly neither of us is terribly happy about, but we've both given in to some level, and we walk away having agreed that the compromise is better than the battle. But in the world of business and business success, I would like to suggest that there's another world that is not a, a zero-sum game. Because each of these four choices, the pie is fixed. There's a sum that suggests that without division, one will get more than the other or all of it. The world of collaboration or problem solving is where the constructive conversations can take us to creative solutions. Collaboration is where the value of the issue, the importance of the relationship are both supremely high. And in our working relationships and our business endeavors, most of the ethical confrontations that we are called upon to respond to are of that sort. Can we afford to avoid? Can we afford to accommodate? Or must we try to find that route, the pathway to problem solving? And to me, that's where the collaborative outcomes can teach us how to have those difficult conversations, how to promote creative solutions. The best way to illustrate how we might choose differently in this setting is assume that for a moment, when we step out of here, you and I are going in the opposite directions down the hallway here at the patrolling club, and it's just you and me. And there on the ground between us is a hundred dollar bill. Now at this moment in time, we have some choices, don't we? What if you and I are both avoiders? What will we do when we both spy that hundred dollar bill? Walk right on by, not catch the eye of the other because you see, I can't stand the thought of competing with you over something of value. So I'll just keep right on walking and so will you. Well, what if both of us are accommodators? What would we choose to do? You take it. No, 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 you take it. No, no, you saw it first. You take it. No, no, please, I insist. You take it. And we engage in this competitive effort to give it away because that's our choice as accommodators. But now, this is the one where we find ourselves most likely uh, in place. What happens if we are both competitors? See how fast you can die from that. <laughs> I'll bet you I can beat you to that $100 bill. And if our hands touch it at the same time, the struggle will be on. Because I want to have it, and I don't want you to have it. And the competitive choice is, I will take it at your expense. And a compromise looks like what? Oh, look, here we have a $100 bill. Let's see if we can go find some change and you can have 50 and I can have 50. But what would it look like if two collaborators saw that $100 bill on the floor? Oh, look, I wonder if there are some more. Let's look around and let's see what else we might find. Or, let's take that hundred and see how we can turn it into two hundred. That's the problem-solving choice when addressing a situation that's difficult. And how we choose to be collaborative 
is a measure of how I think we choose to be successful in dealing with ethical conflicts. Another key idea is that in conflict we need to learn how to go below the line. I like to think of conflict and the way we deal with it as an iceberg. An iceberg, as we all know, 10% above the water, 90% below the water. Above the water are where we are positional, because we each on any issue may have a different position, and that's where we differentiate. You express your reasons and rationale and why you want to have it your way. I express my reasons and rationale and why I want to have it my way. But if we stay there, the likelihood of problem solving becomes increasingly remote. Because the longer we focus on our differences over the positions that we have taken, the more likely conflict is to escalate. And so to be effective in dealing with these concerns when people are in conflict with each other, we like to think of what's below the line, and that's the interests that each of us have. Can you help us with events? I'm not being able to advance it here. Because below the waterline, the difference between the personalization and the differentiation of conflict above the water and what motivates us, what we are driven by in terms of our core values, perhaps our fears, perhaps our aspirations. We can have a totally different conversation about the issue once we begin to explore our interests. And below the waterline, is the integrative problem solving that really is the mark of the professional problem solver collaborator. Best example of this that I know of occurred now almost 30 years ago when Israel and Egypt did what most of us would have thought impossible, create peace in the Middle East. And you remember the history of the warfare before 1967 and until 1978, uh, when the Camp David Accords were realized. Because for decades, the war was constant between Israel and Egypt. And in 1967, Israel decided to do something about that conflict. And so it invaded Israel, the Sinai Peninsula, and took a major swath of territory out of the belief that if it conquered and controlled more of the area that Egypt had been launching its military actions out of, that peace would prevail. But from 1967 until 1978, peace did not prevail. The warfare escalated. It continued to get worse, and the battles were pitched. Lives were lost. Military action was nonstop. But in 1978, a different kind of conversation was had. Because until then, Israel and Egypt were focused on the issue, the Sinai Peninsula, and their positions on it. It's mine. No, it's mine. In 1978 at Camp David, a different approach to examine why each of those countries had such a claim to this worthless patch of sand led to a conversation about what motivated their need for that land. For Israel, the answer was, it's clear. We're interested in safety. We want our people to be free from military encroachment. For Egypt, it was clear. We, we are only interested in our sovereignty. That worthless piece of land that you call it, has been under the, the Egyptian flag for millennia. It was Egypt's in the time of the pharaohs. The outcome of Camp David, which occurred in over 13 days, was to distill it to its essence. Egypt had its interests protected with sovereignty. Israel had its interests protected with safety. By creating a demilitarized zone on the border of Egypt and Israel, 
The armaments were out, but the flags of Egypt could fly. And it was interests-based, integrative problem-solving that led to a peace that has lasted for over 30 years. Not a shot has been fired across the Egypt-Israeli border since 1978. That's the difference between looking at what motivates us and talking with each other about the things that we either may have in common or could satisfy that takes place when we go below the line. And because 90% of the conflict is probably below the line, that's where the hardest work is done. So in ethical confrontations, the questions could often be, why does this behavior ultimately not meet your needs? Can't we have a conversation about how to change behavior, rectify the wrong, that ultimately is in our best interests. But at some point, it may not be possible to save both relationships and protect the issues, but the only way you can attempt to do so is to have those below the waterline conversations. The last key idea I'd like to share with you is that in conflict, we need to learn how to seek durable agreements. Too often when we are in a confrontation with others, it may be something simple, it may be something complex, but we tend to focus solely on the outcome or the product of that conversation. How is it that we are going to resolve this? What's the solution going to look like? If we are simply focused on the outcome and don't pay attention to the other two sides of that three-legged stool, the process and the people, we're going to miss the opportunity to create a better solution. So many times we've seen outcomes not last because the process was not protected and the people weren't treated with dignity. In, in, a, in a majority of the ethical lapses that we have to consider and look at as case studies, examine each of them to see to what degree was process followed, that people could trust that the process, the system worked, and attention given to those kinds of conversations that illustrate the below the line interests, and to what degree were people respected. Because the failure to do both leads us with a stool of only one leg, and if all we're focused upon is the product then we're probably going to miss the mark. I'm grateful that a law firm, when I was a young man, was respectful not only of the outcome of that conversation about ethical behavior, but was also interested in making sure that the people were respected. And the processes of investigation and bringing to light behavior that was detrimental to not only an individual in that firm whom they also respected, but to the clients with whom that firm had a responsibility. And the process of getting to a place where a recommendation could be issued, were all working in sync with each other. Collectively, the outcome was good even though a relationship was ultimately severed because to that individual it was offered as an outcome that he could accept if he chose to work on his issues. He chose not to accept that option. He chose the path, not the law firm, and therefore his end was chosen by him. I'm a sailor, I love to say, when I'm not doing whatever I do for uh, a living, if I could get a chance, I would go find a sailboat and get on it. I think that sailing illustrates in so many ways the power of process and people and product. And is an example of how, as businesses, we can be ever more successful because sailing is a team sport. I think ethics is a team sport. And if you've ever spent time in a sailing environment, you know 
that you, in essence, can achieve the impossible on a sailboat. Without turning on the motor, you can actually sail into the wind. It makes no sense. It's not physically possible. But by the coordination of wind and wave and the direction of sail, by tacking into the wind, you can actually set a destination that flies in the teeth of the prevailing winds. And it seems to me that ethics is very similar. And the way in which, as our organizations function, if we have the systems in place, if we have the respect for people and process and product, and train our people not merely in what the code of conduct says, but how they too can work within that code to be effective problem solvers and respect them for doing so, we're going to have far fewer ethical lapses. And we're going to see far more organizations like this one springing up and speaking for what is the predominant model in American business. And that's ethical outcomes. Stephen Harrison, that great book if you wish to pick it up, has written The Manager's Book of Decencies. How small gestures build great companies. And among the kinds of examples that he gives is the example of Colgate Palmolive, an organization that is known for its ethical conduct and behavior. And one of its CEOs, Ruben Mark, who may have recalled the story, was once presented by a new hire of Colgate Palmolive with a CD that contained all of the business plans and marketing activities that were in operation on behalf of the competitor who the employee had just left. You're the CEO. You're in possession of a wealth of information. What does an ethical culture do? What Mark did was he put the CD in an envelope and mailed it to the CEO of that other competitor and told him, this came into our possession, it hasn't been reviewed, it will not be worked from, this is your property. Without the systems, the culture, the training, the ability to stand up and say and do what is the ethical thing, then we don't stand a chance of inculcating ethical behavior on the part of our individuals. Another example that Harrison provides is that the CEO of Starbucks, in one of those small decencies that he engages in, every month sends and signs birthday cards to 500 Starbucks employees every month just to say thank you for being a part of our organization. You are valued. That's a process that dignifies people and creates a culture in which behavior can be examples. Rich Carlton, who is a Baldrige Award winner for a number of occasions, one or at least maybe two times for their quality initiatives, is another organization that sets itself apart by the way in which it empowers its employees to do the right thing. As you may know, every employee of Rich Carlton has the power, the authority, unilaterally, to spend up to $2,000 of the change money to take care of a customer concern. They don't have to get approval for it. They don't have to go to their manager. If they find an employee who's got a problem and they can solve it in under $2,000, they can do that themselves. That creates a culture in which people have the imprimatur to do what's right. Just a personal example of how that culture uh, just amazes me. I was making many trips to Atlanta a number of years ago, and because the Ritz Carlton in Atlanta was just across from the office, I often stayed there. And on one occasion, I'd gotten in very late at night. It was after 10 o'clock. The restaurant was closed, and I asked at the desk if there was any way to get a bite to eat. And they said, well, the restaurant's closed, but please feel free. So they restaffed the restaurant with a server and a host, and although closed, they served me. Well, as I sat down, the only one in the restaurant, I pulled out a telephone slip from my pocket and began to write on it, making some notes of whatever it was I was about to do or say the next day. 
And the young man who only poured my water came up to me and said, Mr. Richsmith, would you like a pad of paper? He knew my name. He saw a need. He met it without being asked. That's the kind of culture that organizations create in which people have the empowerment and are recognized as capable of solving problems. Hopefully we will all be about the business of looking at this holistic approach to problem solving that will allow our businesses to be increasingly ethical. These are some of the essentials that I think are critical if an organization intends to be an ethically run organization. And among them, you can see that it must begin with leadership. The people at the top, if they are modeling something other than the ethical behavior that they expect on behalf of others, will not get it. Because by their behavior, they've undercut the system that's in place to ensure ethical behavior. And it runs all the way down the line to being certain that individuals know how to and are going to be supported in the way in which they raise their hands and indicate that they have a difficulty or have observed conduct that is less than appropriate. We can continue to be a difference. And the fact that this consortium consists of so many people and organizations committed to being a difference is just illuminating in the extreme. I would hope that we can all get on the sailboats and sail out into the waters that's sometimes choppy, sometimes threatening. And with our teams and with our training and with the leadership and setting course for ethical behavior, we will become a different kind of culture that people will look to and say, it's unusual for ethical lapses to occur. Thank you all for being such a part of such a sterling organization. Thank you for inviting us to be here. We appreciate it. Blessings on you all. We have time for some questions, and so if there's anything that would come to mind as a result of any of either these comments or others, please feel free to ask. Any comments or questions about anything that we've spoken about? Problems that led them to where they are today. Could you share that with the, with the audience? Bob asks that I, I share my uh, very unbiased opinions about the automotive <laughs> industry and the plight of such organizations. That comes from a seven year stint with General Motors where I began my adult career. And I worked there in the early 70s, and this is an example, I think, of why that company and others in that industry. <coughs> are in the straits that they are today. In 1970, General Motors had a strategic planning process that began with some key assumptions that they were willing to basically bet their company on. One of those assumptions, for example, was that the consumer movement is a flash in the pan. That we don't have to worry about safety because consumers, frankly, are far more interested in style than safety. Now remember, this was in the era of the Corvair and Ralph Nader and unsafe at any speed. So it wasn't as if they were unaware. Their reaction to the consumer movement was to ignore it. That was an assumption on which their strategic plan was based. Another assumption that they made was that uh, foreign competition is not to be worried about because American consumers are not going to buy foreign cars. Another assumption was that the government is our enemy. Interesting assumption in light of today's events. Another assumption was that the best managers always come from within. If you want a myopic view of your market and your uh, world, do that as a number of companies have. Unlike Ford, who chose a Boeing executive, and you see 
for today is not accepting bailout money because of a different approach that wasn't as inbred. And so to Bob's comments, a, a large degree of our economic failure, I think, can be attributed to our assumptions and the arrogance about which we go about doing our business. And particularly in ethics, I think it's critical for us to understand that we are not above making mistakes. We are not above any one of us from being confronted with an ethical dilemma that we don't have a ready response to. And if, if we are going to be the ethical uh, providers, then we'd best be about the business of ensuring that our organizations respect and inculcate and respect and train people in how to do that. And I, I love the stories that Bob was sharing last night about Boeing and how it has had to face some really tough questions that behavior in contrast to their ethical standards forced them to act and act quickly. When you take those steps at the top of the organization, you say to everyone in the organization, this is the kind of company that we wish to be known as. And that's what it takes for the work that you all do in business ethics to make a difference. So congratulations to Boeing and congratulations to all of you. Jen. What do you think as businesses we can do to restore trust in the economy? And, you know, we talked uh, talk about that last night. What are some ideas you might have that we can do as regular business people? Well, Shannon asked, what can we do as regular business people? I don't know that there are any other kind. <laughs> to restore trust in the economy. And there are always going to be outliers. There are always going to be the exceptions. And they're the ones, as David said earlier, that the newspapers are going to pick up on because that sells newsprint. But to the extent that we can promote the good that's being done and speak optimistically about our peers in business, we will do a great job of counteracting the public's perception that the newspapers tell the only story. I'm a believer in the power of systems. Uh, systems is a fascinating study because organizations are like living beings. We don't impose from the top an order of activity and expect that it will happen simply because we said so. But complex adaptive systems, as our businesses are, really are changed from within. And as individuals act consistent with their area of concern within their area of influence, they change perceptions. By that I mean, we're all concerned about things we have no control over. We're all concerned about the state of the economy and banking and finance. Maybe some of you in this room are in a position to do something about that. I'm certainly not. So I have an area of concern that is far larger than my area of influence. For me to be effective, I have to work in my area of influence to reflect the behavior and the values that I expect in the larger area of concern. And when I act consistent in my small world with what I say I expect of others, I'm communicating that I can be trusted. Organizations that have systems in place to reflect that culture that we've talked about today that you're dedicated to addressing are those that are going to continue to build trust. They're not going to build trust with a headline. They're not going to build trust by getting a news report on CNN because those organizations exist to sell controversy. They're going to get attention by making a difference in the people who watch the way you work in the small decencies that we exhibit and express to others. And I think that's the most effective way to change the distrust that the public has for businesses. Other comments, questions? If not, I'll turn it back over to Shannon, and thank you so much for this opportunity.